from LPM, Louisville Public Media. Support comes from the Eye Care Institute and Butchertown Clinical Trials, where they strive for diversity, equity, and inclusion within their staff, patients, and clinical trial participants. To learn more, visit butchertown.clinic. Hey everyone, this is Charlene Buckles. And I'm Nima Kulkarni. I know it's been a while, and we are currently working on season two, but in the wake of Monterey Park and Half Moon Bay shootings, we wanted to go ahead and record this special episode. We felt like we needed to make this space now and process together as an AAPI community. I know this is a developing story, and there's a lot we don't know about the shootings, but we're going to focus on how we feel and not what we know. As some of you all might know, Where Y'all Really From was a podcast that was created by us in the wake of the Atlanta massacre shooting. And now with another act of violence in the AAPI community, we just felt it was necessary to record the special episode. The people who had committed this shootings are two elderly male immigrants of Asian descent. One is 66 and the other is 72. And um, at Half Moon Bay, there were seven people killed. In Monterey Park, there was at least 11 people who have um, who were killed, and there were many more that were injured. And what we also know is that Monterey Park is a predominantly Asian community. I feel like, and we talked about this before, and in, in, in trying to process it still, I still do not, I cannot figure out why this feels so differently. You know, we, and we've talked about this too in, in various group texts and like, you know, other conversations, but, you know, Sandy Hook felt different for me. That was when I was a teacher and it hit so deeply at that point. Uvalde, when I, when I, you know, as a mother of two, that hit so differently. Atlanta Massacre, and the reason why we started this podcast of, you know, a, a, a shooter that was targeting Asian women In Atlanta, that also hit in a different way. This just feels so different. And I cannot pinpoint why. And I can't pinpoint all the feelings that surround it. But I do think it just because they were two male, elderly male um, immigrants of Asian descent in a predominantly Asian community and that intra-community violence that was happening, it just lands in such a different way. It does. And I think one of the things that it's, I think that you touched upon is that it's something that occurred within the Asian community. And so there's a lot of initial reactions that people had. Was this a hate crime? Was this something that we should be afraid of? Because we, you know, again, in the wake of the Atlanta shootings, we knew that that was at a really sort of peak of anti-Asian hate, anti-Asian violence all around the country. And so was this sort of a repeat of that happening? Was it all happening again? Should our Asian communities be on heightened alert? Um, And one of the things that, you know, you mentioned also is that it's happening at a moment of celebration. It's Mm -hmm. happening at a moment of real cultural recognition for the Asian community. Um, And at the same time, it's being perpetrated by elders. And, you know, Charlene, you're Filipina, I'm Indian. And all throughout the Asian community, there is a deep-rooted respect for your elders. Mm -hmm. There is a deep-rooted feeling of affinity to the past and the memories that they hold and their place in our communities. And so one of the things that we're looking at, and this is even explored in Everything Everywhere All at Once, is this idea of generational trauma. Like we Mm -hmm. don't talk about trauma in that way within our families or maybe even within our communities. Um, and, And I think one of the things that the reason this is hitting differently and the reason we wanted to do this this segment uh, now is because I think we're still processing and there's a lot of things that everybody's feeling, everybody's reacting to, and everybody is kind of, you know, having a different moment. Like it's hitting differently for different reasons for different even Asian communities Mm -hmm. um, because it's, again, it would be akin to somebody, um, you know, in a Diwali celebration or some some major cultural celebration uh, being really, really 
um, tarnished by this horrible, tragic um, shooting and act of violence that occurred. And we just don't know why. Right. And that's something that and we and it's something we just don't expect from our elders. Exactly. And I do think that, again, going back to the, the celebration, I talked to a friend of mine, you know, in Lunar New Year, at least in the Chinese tradition, there's a lot of firecrackers that happen. You know, and like at mm-hmm. first, some people thought it was firecrackers and, and they had this. A friend of mine was saying how they were celebrating and their mom said, don't go into the new year sad. You need to like, you know, process your feelings later, be happy and like let's celebrate. And they were having firecrackers and they had, you know, they were expressing all this fear and like just anxiety around those loud noises hearing what happened in Monterey Park. And again, just so many layers to that one little conversation I had with my friend. One, like that pressure to put your feelings down, process it later and move on and go into the new year happy. Also like trying to still be joyful and celebratory and having, you know, go this really important cultural uh, celebration that you're having with your family, but not dealing with the feelings. And I think that, I think that is maybe a a big theme that I'm finding this week with many of the people I'm talking to um, or talking with. But, um, but yeah, so I I do think like, I want to explore that a little bit because we've talked about in um, many of our conversations in this podcast about um, our elders and like coming to America and how they, especially our parents, for example, they came at much older age where they've already been established, you know, in their 20s or 30s. And they've been it's a totally new culture, oftentimes a totally new language. And they experience all this trauma. We then either are born here or our one and a half generation immigrants also experience that trauma sometimes of trying to balance both worlds. And I think at least for our generation, you know, there's an emphasis on mental health. There's an emphasis of like take, taking the pause and being able to rest and process and all those things. I, at least myself, have not had that conversation with my mom of like all the stuff they had to go through and all of the bullying and all of the various spaces that they had to make face and just smile at about, you know, getting taunted or like, you know, what have you as a first generation immigrant and then not processing that because it's not part of our community to talk about feelings. Yeah. And I mean, I think it's fascinating that conversation that you had in the in the immediate wake of the shooting. They're being told to sort of internalize and suppress their feelings, their reactions to this horrible thing that's happened because of this cultural tradition of going into the new year happy. And I think that kind of encapsulates the Asian community, and I'm not, I'm just generalizing here, but, you know, the idea, like, we do not just discuss our mental health in the free way that non-Asian communities might, and also generationally, like, our parents, our grandparents aren't going to be discussing that because that's not the important thing. You know, they came here, they were the ones that sort of forged uh, the communities, they landed, they they made this this home for their families, and so when we were born or, you know, when we grew up here, we were we had a home. We had uh, some some level of stability in the United States. Right. They made that. They created that. And so whatever they went through was way more, you know, traumatic and way more um, impactful in in their psyche. And yet they don't talk about it because that was not the priority, right? The urgency is mm-hmm. getting a home, making sure there's food on the table, making sure your kids are safe um, and just, you know, making that stable existence in this new community, in this new country. And so your feelings are not the thing that you're mm-hmm. going to be discussing. Your feelings and how you are reacting to any setbacks or any bullying or anything that you any discrimination that you may have faced That's not the important thing. The important thing is that you got here and you've made it a success and your family's able to thrive and survive. And I think that is definitely true, certainly even in in my family and and just in our communities in general. 
Um, even if you acknowledge that you need help, you're not going to be discussing that with other members of the community. You're not maybe even going to be discussing that with members of your family. Um, and I think that is something that we really need to take a hard look at again, because the, one of the reasons we're having such a difficult time processing this is a, that respect for our elders and then b this feeling of how did we fail them? Because what is this, what were they holding inside that then exploded in this way at this moment of celebration and cultural importance in their 60s and 70s? Because my therapist will say, if you you can compartmentalize all the feelings, but eventually it's going to spew out. Eventually it's going to come out in other ways, right? And so that, I think, is a reality and a gut check. And like you said, like, how are we? as the one and a half generation failing them. And it's really interesting you also made that point too because I will say that is a really hard question for me because and to be very vulnerable about it, in my life I have not had positive male Asian figures. In, like there's only one person out of my uncles and my my biological father, all of those things, like all of the all of the people in my life that were male Asians were very traumatizing for me. And I did not we did not we still don't have positive relationships except for my grandfather. And when I saw the picture of the first picture that came out of the um, the Half Moon Bay shooter in his hat and he was, you know, walk, they had just um, had just handcuffed him he looked like my grandfather and that really messed me up and I had to and it it, it, I had to pause about it because I kept thinking like what this could be someone in my family of all of the unresolved issues that I have with the male figures in my life it could have been one of them to do that do I have an obligation Mm -hmm. to help them when I'm still dealing with the trauma that they have inflicted on me or miscommunication, whatever you want to call it, but I'm still dealing with that, could I reach out to those Asian male figures who are now older, who are now in their 60s and 70s to say, like, how can I help you? And that's really hard. That's really hard for me to, like, square that hole because I'm still dealing with my trauma that within those relationships, you know, and so... I think it's difficult, and I hear that a lot from like a lot of one and a half generation. And you'll find like, there's some, you know, there's a lot of like Instagram accounts and all these different social media accounts where we are still trying to process our um, emotions and trauma and generational trauma and, and balancing all of those things, and yet trying to hold that respect for them and take care of them in such different ways. You know, we're not. And May has, one of our co-hosts, May, has has mentioned this before of being able to support your family and build like a, you know, another master suite to make sure your your, your parents are taken care of. I talk to my mom about that all the time. Like it's kind of a running joke that she'll eventually move in with us. But like how those relationships impact my mental health and how I need to have strong boundaries. I'm still dealing with all of that. Like it are we obligated to take care of our elders in that way or do we redefine what that looks like and not just have them live with us? You know, like a- yeah. No, I mean, I think, I think that's, uh, those are very important points. And, you know, when you mentioned the word obligation and then you mentioned taking care of them. And I think of course, in every Asian community, there is an incredibly strong sense that when you, when your parents get older, you're going to be taking care of them. You know, and that's every generation. When your parents get older, you're going to take care of them, whatever that looks like, you know, because a lot of times there's, you know, you might be in one place, but your parents might be back home. And so how do you take care of them there? If everyone's in the same place, what does it mean? What does it look like to take care of them? And then again, going back to if you're the one supposed to take care of them, then how have you failed these folks where they are having to resort to violence to express something Um, some trauma that they have been internalizing and we don't know for how long. And, you know, one of the things that struck me when I was reading about the Half Moon Bay shooter was that he had 
he had done this thing because he was tired of the bullying that he had endured. Um, and we don't know for how long because he was 66 years old when this happened. Um, and we talk about bullying in kids, for instance. We talk pretty frequently about that. We also talk about bullying in terms of how it impacts parents, what they should do in teaching their kids, um, and how to treat other children, right? How do you treat each other? What we don't talk about is bullying in the Asian community in terms of what that looks like and how you deal with that, how you react to that. Because again, it's this idea of, well, you should be focused on school. Nothing else really matters. So those, you know, don't worry about it or just move on, like move through it, Mm -hmm. push through it. uh, Because the thing that you need to do is succeed (laughs) in, in your education, in your career, whatever it is. One of the things, though, that I also thought about was generationally, we also don't talk about bullying in our older, right, um, than the previous generation. So in our parents, our grandparents, who may very well have experienced a whole other level of bullying and Mm -hmm. discrimination that we that they certainly don't talk about, that we don't talk about. And we don't then talk about how they should deal with it in terms of access to mental health care or are they able to talk to their families or community members about what they've experienced. We may be able to, right, sitting here, our generation is able to talk about those things and know that it's wrong and call it out when we see it or learn how to how to deal with it in our day-to-day if it's something that we're experiencing and microaggressions or something even more overt, but they do not. And they may have experienced it, but they don't know how to talk about it. They don't have that language and they Mm -hmm. don't have that comfort. Um, And there's still a stigma attached to it because, again, your role is taking care of your children. And so when we're when the children are now supposed to take care of their parents, how much do we need to talk about the mental health care that they need as well? Right. Because, again, as you mentioned, we don't know the level of bullying and trauma that they had to endure that they've tried to hide from us you know I'm and again talking from my own experience it took my mom a very long time to talk about how we were undocumented I mean I had to essentially I mean it was in my 30s when I was like I need you to tell me about this story because I'm about to join this board and they want to know why I'm joining this board about legal about immigration and legal services and so I really need to know what really happened between the age of 7 to 12 when I was by myself every single day and we had exit plans, you know, and it was really there was a lot of shame in that. And it there is, you know, a, that trauma of having to go through the immigration system, a system that was made to keep immigrants out, the trauma of having to pick to leave your family a half a world away to go into this culture you've never been for to see snow for the first time and not be prepared <laughs> to go out in the snow and like figure out where to go all of those driving driving you know she grew up in metro manila and so it, like i think she got her license when she was like in her 30s and so it was like they experienced so much of that plus on top of that the microaggressions that we experienced growing up as well in a predominantly white space like Kentucky and being what I think one of the terms that Dan uses is being um, killed with a thousand paper cuts Mm -hmm. right like it's like on top of this system that's meant to keep you down you also have these little pain points throughout Mm -hmm. and it bubbles over and sometimes you see it and again something I'm working on in therapy like you see it Inside your home and how your relationship then is formed with your parents and that type of, um, I don't want to say dysfunction, but it is, it becomes like this dysfunctional relationship because the aggression is taken out on you sometimes or like the lack of communication or energy is taken out on you as a child. And then you take that same and again, this is a generalization because I don't know it. We, there's still a lot of information coming out about these shootings. But it makes me wonder when you say like that person was bullied, what it took for them to get to a point to go out and do this. You know, mm-hmm. at, at 66 and 72, when the average shooter, mass shooter is usually in like a young male. You know, so it's very curious. 
to me and again just a little, like a lot to process yeah and I, I think that's an that's a really good point because one of the things that we focus on when we talk about mass shootings is this idea that these are young men they don't have full control like impulse control um, and so they are going to be more reactive and they're able to you know, a lot of them live in places with easy access to weapons. And, you know, you have to think especially about the Monterey Park shooter um, who had these, like, high-capacity magazines and rifles that would have been very difficult to get in a place like California, which has one of the most restrictive um, set of gun laws in the entire nation. So there would have been a lot of thought. This was not, neither of these were impulsive acts where somebody got you know, snapped, this idea of somebody snapped and they just went out and got a weapon or had a weapon already and then went out and, and started killing people. This took a lot of thought in, in sort of accumulating the weapons, in getting the plan together. The fact that it happened, at, you know, on the Lunar New Year um, mm-hmm. during that celebration, um, you know, I think, I think that is, is, is a whole different set of things that we have to process, this idea of these elders being so traumatized and then turning that into this external aggression, which we also don't necessarily associate with our elders, uh, because it would have taken a lot of calculation and thought to have this occur at the time that it did and the way that it did. Um, and again, that shooting resulted in 11 deaths and, and a lot more wounded. So it, it was pretty devastating. Um and it's 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 just a whole other layer that's added to this conversation that we also don't necessarily talk about because mm-hmm. how are we um, how are we allowing this to happen and sort of fester to that point? And that I think goes back to the, your really interesting question and, and expanding it more of how are we taking care of our community? You know, mm-hmm. not just of our elders, but of our, our AAPI community, one that is a many, many cultures that are so different, but yet very similar experiences. And I think that is, I think that I, that's just one of the questions that I'm still trying to process. How are we showing up for our community in that way, not gaslighting their experience and, and really supporting them? Because at the end of the day, we we're the only ones that we got. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly true. And I think one of the things that we have to, we have to really take a hard look at is when we are talking about taking care of our elders, when we are talking about taking care of our communities, that we who have the capacity, even though we're sort of still processing some generational um, issues and we're still processing, you know, being, navigating being AAPI in a predominantly white culture, certainly here in Kentucky, um, what, are we doing? What resources are we providing? What is the language and the space that we are allowing for our community members, for our family members, just to talk about it, to take that on proactively and connect folks with resources? Because I think that it's now clear that we it's incumbent on us, no matter what else we have going on, what else we're processing, that we're the ones that are going to have to create that space we're the ones that are going to have to break that stigma and that cycle mm-hmm. of just silence and suppressing your feelings and moving through it, moving past it. Um, and we're going to have to just add that in our list of, of sort of, you know, taking care of our communities and our family members. Because this is, this is a clear, I think, example and reason of, of why we cannot ignore uh, the mental health of our seniors anymore. Mm-hmm. I did feel really alone when it happened, you know. I mean, again, I mean, it's, there's a lot going on. Everyone has a lot going on. But again, because it hit so differently, I was feeling a certain way. And I know that, like, my Asian mom group text was going off, one Asian mom particularly, who it was also processing it. Our group text was going off of, you know, the AAPI, <laughs> where y'all really from, group text is going off. And and then also the AAPI ERG that I'm a part of at work, we, you know, we came together in this space. But I did feel like, where was everyone else, you mm-hmm. know? And I felt like, why hadn't people reached out to us? And 
and again, and I know there's like some, and I I know that I'm not like, I shouldn't expect that from people, but there was something about it where I was like, why aren't you all seeing my pain? Like, why aren't you seeing that like, this is upsetting to us and that we don't know how to process it and no one's reaching out to see if we are okay. Yeah. I mean, I think one of the reasons is because it's really difficult to categorize. It doesn't just fall into a neat little bucket where this is a young white man that's, sh- you know, another sort of pattern. It does not fit the pattern. And so we we don't, you know, is this a hate crime? Is this an act of violence uh, against just an individual that's that's more personal? Is it something that is part of a larger pattern that is emerging? We don't know any of that. But for, like, the media and people even even in the Asian community, Mm -hmm. uh, but certainly outside the Asian community, it's, you know, is this something that can be categorized as an act of hate against a particular community? And because it was perpetrated by elders within that community, the answer was no. And so we moved on Mm -hmm. because that's not the story. So... The nuances of this, I think, are something that it's we're just going to have to process and figure out ourselves because it's not going to happen externally. And so I think I think you're absolutely right that what, where where is that discussion? Where is that larger discussion about what actually happened and why? That is something that is has been left entirely, I think, to the AAPI community because within the larger community, sort of their obligation and their sense of responsibility is done. Right. And that, in my opinion. Well, no, it's true. And and I do think that that is a part of that. But that at the same time, it's like, who are your true allies? And maybe we have, maybe I have my answer. You know, the, the real, the, maybe we have our answer where, like, we have to just take care of ourselves. I don't want to believe that, though. I want to believe that there are other allies outside of our community that do care for us and really want us to be to be cared for. And I think that might just be another episode altogether. <laughs> but I, I do think that that was another layer to this that I was hoping to, that I'm still trying to process yeah. of what that means for people to show up for us who are often quiet and don't want to cause, you know, alarm bells or don't want, they're not very vocal about our feelings and, and um, are seen as like that model minority. And so we're going to like go inside of ourselves and process internally. I just want to, I just want to break that idea of us and know that, okay, we're still here. We're processing. We're in pain right now. Please show up for us in these ways. Or I just ask us if we're okay. Acknowledge that we're in pain. So I don't know. That It's just another layer of this that, again, I'm just trying to figure out and what and articulate and trying to figure out what that means. But I know that it is like another data point yeah. of this whole um, week, I think. It is. And I mean, honestly, I think it's an opportunity for as we as a community work through some of these things and figure that figure it out for ourselves, how we're going to be moving forward and why this happened. I think it's an opportunity because people just may not know to ask. Right. It's not necessarily an intentional thing or a deliberate thing. It's just, you know, we can we can tell them this is what is going on and this is where you need to be in terms of supporting us as we, as we ourselves process this, because it's, again, it's not falling into a category or pattern that anybody is familiar with. And so I think it's an, it's a way to, I think you're right, not to just process it internally and then be silent about it, but to go through it, process it within the community, within yourselves, um, within ourselves, and then talk about it with, with everybody, with allies, with friends, with folks that are not AAPI, a- other AAPI communities, um, so that we don't let the silence and the stigma overtake the conversation again. We talked a lot, a lot about heavy things today. So if you are listening and need some resources, we are building out a list of resources on where y'all really from dot org. There you'll find some links to uh, a few mental health resources.
Support for the Louisville Public Media Podcast Incubator comes from the Community Foundation of Louisville, helping donors in our community establish charitable funds to meet philanthropic goals, creating opportunities to give more through scholarship, charitable checking, and donor-advised funds, and helping donors create a charitable legacy through their estate plan. More at cflouisville.org. Find what's happening in Louisville, all in one online destination. Visit the new lpm.org for daily news, music, newsletters, podcasts, events, and more from LPM, Louisville Public Media.